Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church located on the west side of Chicago. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members of Friendship Baptist Church, we are just blessed that you are joining us uh, this morning for our Sunday School lesson. We are extremely, extremely excited as we inch closer towards the Easter celebration. This is just a wonderful time in the year in the life of a Christian as we begin to celebrate uh, the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I'm really excited about the lessons as we build towards Easter Sunday. Uh, this is April 3rd, 2022, and the title of our lesson is uh, The Resolve to Remember, taken from the 21st chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 11. Our key verse is Matthew chapter 21, verse 5. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a coat, the foal of a donkey. So we're excited as we uh, jump right into this lesson. We have three goals this morning. One, we will examine how the crowd responded to Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. Two, we will examine the reasons why people seek and follow new leadership. And three, third and final, we will grow in our acceptance of Jesus as a leader of hope for each and every age. And that just simply means that the same way that Jesus was extremely important to the age at the time of our story some 2,000 years ago, Jesus is just as important to us today as we continue to build towards the future and look towards our future with hope, knowing that no matter what life hands out, God has something better in store for us. So a wonderful lesson. We'll jump right in after prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to study your word. We thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives. Father, we thank you for the wonderful gift that you gave us when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. And we thank you for the sacrifice that he made when he freely laid down his life that we might live and have everlasting life. And so for all of those sacrifices, for those blessings that we did not deserve, we are so thankful this morning. Father, as we continue to move closer towards the Easter celebration, help us to remember exactly what you gave up so that we might have life and that we uh, might live a life that's pleasing in your sight and recognition or in, at least an acknowledgement of that sacrifice. Thank you for this church, our pastor, each and every Sunday school instructor and teacher, each and every single Sunday school student, no matter where they might be. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, Jesus, at the age of 30, began his earthly ministry. And so for three years, he went around teaching, preaching, healing, and performing miracles. And now after three years of, uh, of ministry, Jesus is at the end of his earthly ministry, preparing to enter Jerusalem for what we know would eventually be his crucifixion and death but also his resurrection. So the excitement could not be quantified what was taking place. This was the Passover celebration, and Jews or children of Israel from all over the place were uh, uh, navigating towards Jerusalem so that they can celebrate the Passover feast. As Jesus prepares to enter, uh, there must be some uh, a few different outcomes in the minds of the disciples, in the minds of the citizens, uh, even in the mind of Jesus himself. Uh, you know, Jesus recognizes that this is the road that he would eventually travel down that would lead towards his crucifixion. The disciples uh, were unsure of exactly what would take place, and they were probably astonished by the crowd and the, uh, and the prestige that Jesus was uh, had, had reached, the claim that he was receiving. And then the citizens, uh, as they continued to hear about Jesus and word of his uh, power and might begin to travel, they most certainly were looking some, for some type of political reprieve, hoping that Jesus would mark the end of Roman occupation and a return of, of Israel to its former national glory. So again, we're in the midst of a Passover uh, celebration. And uh, if we even look back just to our few previous lessons, when we looked at Ezra and the return uh, of uh, out of Babylonian captivity, how the children of Israel were excited to start worshiping uh, in the temple and resume our practice of the Passover celebration is one of the things that we cover. So we know that the Passover celebration is God uh, not only sparing Israel during the 10th plague at the end of their Egyptian captivity, but it's also a celebration about how God was able to safely see Israel through the wilderness into the promised land, the land of Canaan, a 40 day journey that took 40 years. And so this celebration is in two parts. One, to celebrate their transition from Egyptian captivity into the promised land, and then also to celebrate the hand of God passing over them 
when the first uh, born child of all Egyptians was uh, killed during that 10th plague when Moses and Pharaoh faced off. And we know that was the plague that eventually moved Pharaoh's heart to free the children of Israel, even though God hardened his heart and he pursued after them and they all, of course, drowned in the sea. And so we see the Passover celebration having significance in Egyptian captivity where it was birthed out of. We see the Passover celebration being significant in the Babylonian captivity because they were eager to start worshiping and returning to practicing the Passover celebration. And now, some uh, thousand years later, we also see Jesus uh, as he enters Jerusalem uh, prepared for his passion experience. We see that this happens in the midst of a Passover a celebration. So just a wonderful kind of uh, macro view of how this uh, Passover celebration is not only extremely important in the lives of the children of Israel, but also kind of pops up in very important uh, dates and movements of different things within the faith. So approaching Jerusalem for the last time, Jesus's entrance marks a new hope for Israel. Uh, there's a fear of a messianic uprising from the Romans. Uh, and then it's also a walk into the hands of the executioners for Jesus. So you see all these three different groups kind of excited for different reasons. And that's where our story really uh, picks up. So with so many people expecting so many different outcomes, Jesus shows us not only how to be obedient to God when it is uncomfortable, but also how to face challenges head on, uh, trusting that God will somehow see us through. And we can all testify in our lives that even when God uh, commanded or put us in a position to do something that was difficult or uncomfortable. He always gave us what we needed to make it through and to make uh, to, to complete the task that he has given us. And so we can remain faithful and trusting in God, knowing that he would always do what is necessary in the lives of his people. So our lesson is broken into five different parts, uh, taken from the 21st chapter of Matthew. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And the first portion of our lesson is entitled The Modest King. The Modest King. So now... When they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. So historically, kings would enter a city in one of two ways. They would either ride on a horse to show themselves as a conquering king, or they would ride on a donkey, a donkey excuse me, to show themselves coming in peace. So Jesus not only desires uh, to present his entry into Jerusalem as a peaceful entrance, but it also fulfills scripture as Zechariah prophesied, in uh, Zechariah chapter 9, that the kingdom of Zion would enter lowly and meek, riding on a donkey. So in a similar fashion, when King David's son, Absalom, started his rebellion, David rode his donkey through the streets to show his peaceful response towards his rebellious son. Uh, and so we see, uh, we've seen types of this or, or Old Testament prophecies pointing towards what would happen in the New Testament. We've seen this donkey riding happen in the Old Testament. In life, we are often taught or we're conditioned to give what we get. An eye for an eye seems to be the general response, especially when people are attacking us. However, the Bible makes it clear that we should learn to turn the other cheek and offer forgiveness when people intentionally try to hurt us. So Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, knew exactly how this week would turn out for him. He knew that this entrance into Jerusalem would culminate into him with him being nailed on the cross. Uh, for our sins. So he knew that the very people that would celebrate him on this Sunday would be the ones calling for his crucifixion in just a few short days. Jesus, with all power in his hands, uh, he could have wiped out his enemies. He could have led all of Israel in an insurrection and rebellion against Rome, or he could have flexed his might. But instead, Jesus trusted God. He entered peacefully and he allowed peace to be his way of entrance and his way of introducing himself into the situation. Here we see the perfect illustration of Jesus being both God and man. Uh, the, the, the correct theological term is called the, hyper, uh, the, the hypostatic union. It's, du it's the duality of Jesus uh, as both fully God and fully man. And it's somewhat difficult to understand, at least from our worldly perspective. Uh, the issue was uh, uh, resolved from a theological perspective during the, I want to say, 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries, uh, two councils, the councils of Ephesus and the council of Chalcedon. These two councils where the theologians kind of got together and tried to debate and argue how could Jesus be fully God and fully man. And there was some thought that he was not really a person or that he was more of a spirit walking around. But then they resolved these issues and they came up with this idea that he is fully God and fully man 
at the same time. They concluded that Christ has two natures, God and man, and that those two natures exist simultaneously at the same time within the one incarnation of Jesus as man, the son of God. So we see that Jesus is fully God, equal to God the Father in his divinity, but also fully man, born of flesh and susceptible to the temptations of the world. Yet and still, being fully God and fully man, he's able to go through this difficult uh, time knowing how it will end because he's infinite in his wisdom. So what better way for Jesus to present himself than on a donkey? Riding triumphantly on a donkey to show the mission of peace that God sent him on, that he accepted to bring peace towards the entire world. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a humble way of submitting to the will of God when you have the power and authority to free yourself from the situation you're about to find yourself in. Uh, in a way, Jesus is bringing life and not destroying life, and he's offering hope and eternal peace that only he could bring, even though it means uh, personal death for himself. And when we look at our own lives, when we determine what it is that we're willing to give up for God, how far we're willing to go for the sake of Christ, uh, in, in the 21st century in Western civilization, there are very few times, it's very rare and uncommon, at least in our society in which we live, for a person to lose their life or have their well-being threatened simply because of what they believe. There aren't many Christians uh, being murdered for their faith, at least in our communities. And because of that, we are living in a time where we have so much freedom and so much access, the ability to share the gospel, the ability to interpret the word, the ability to preach and to teach and then receive preaching and teaching. And so because of that, we have to be aware that whatever God asks of us, whatever God requires of us, it, it can never be too much. If we look to Jesus Christ, Jesus was tasked with marching into the very hands of his executioners, yet he did it 100% willingly trusting God the entire time, knowing that no matter how things might appear to be, God had a plan to see him through. And when God asks things of us to sacrifice, to give of our time, of our talents, of our resources for the sake of the kingdom, for the spread of the gospel, for the expense of the ministries that we're a part of, it's so much little in comparison to what he's asked of others throughout history. And we're in a very unique time where we're in a position to do so much more without really costing ourselves much at all. Yet for some reason, the church has kind of turtle shelled and withdrawn from the world. And it's left a huge void that really needs to be filled. And so when we examine how Christ not only followed the instructions of God, knowing what it would cost him, and then when we look at our own lives, it should push us to want to do more, to have a desire to be better used by God, to be of better use to God. So we see the modest king in Matthew chapter 21, verse 1, where we jump down to verses 2 and 3, and it's entitled, The Lord Needs Them. The text reads, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. So Jesus in verses 2 and 3 sends two disciples to go into a village and to get a donkey and her coat. Jesus instructs them to take the animals and that if anyone says anything to them, to simply respond that the Lord has need of them. It is easy to look at this portion of the story with the 21st century lens. However, we must remind our rewind our minds, excuse me, to a period of time some 2,000 years ago. There was no cell phone or email for Jesus to send word ahead. There was no widespread dissemination of pictures and information. So uh, most likely uh, these disciples were uh, un not recognized. They were strangers in a strange land. Uh, most likely the place where the disciples were sent was foreign to them. And the, the and the disciples were foreign to the owners of the animals and the people that were standing around witnessing this entire story play out. While we are not as explicitly told uh, how the arrangement was made, we are sure that Jesus, as God, was in need of something. He sent two of his followers to get the job done, and those that had what was necessary was willing to give what they had for use 
of, of God. It's a wonderful illustration to show how the kingdom of God can work if we all just simply cooperate together and give what we have for use, I mean, to the God to be used by him. Over the past few years, a common theme in many of our churches has been a decline in resources and a decline in attendance. And that was only further exacerbated by the COVID uh, pandemic. From a world perspective, we look at numbers and we look at finances and we determine what we can and can't do based on those black and white numbers. However, as people of God, we should have learned by now, both through our own experiences and through the experiences of our ancestors, that there is nothing that is too hard for God. If we take a second look and re-examine our churches and our ministries, we will recognize that God has already given us everything that we need in order to do the work that he has charged us to do. The disciples didn't question the instructions of Jesus. They didn't, the, the, the owners of the animals didn't stop the people of God from following God's instructions. All of this served in allowing the people of God to work together in completing the will of the Lord. And it seems as if they had very little information. And it's difficult for us to even move forward one step without knowing how this step will end and what's coming next and what, what, what are the subsequent steps to take before I even take the first. However, God is not telling us to get the whole story. God is not telling us that he'll even show us the full vision. God is telling us that if we simply be obedient to him, that we can be a piece of, a, of, of such a larger work. And if we are all doing what God has taught us to do, we can be a part of something truly amazing. In life, it is difficult to understand how we will get the job done when we are under-resourced, when our numbers continue to dwindle. But Jesus has shown us so many times during his ministry that big things can be accomplished when a small group of people are willing to submit to God's will. It was a small boy with a happy bill that fed thousands of people, 5,000 plus women and children. In our own lives, we must determine what we are willing to give up, what we are willing to use and to dedicate towards the work of God in our own lives, in our own families, in our own homes, and even in our own ministries. We have all shared the burden of seeing a need and desiring to do more uh, with, with our communities decaying around us, with so many challenges facing the church. The trick of the enemy is to present such a large challenge that we convince ourselves that our contribution, that the role that we play would be too small to even make a difference. However, today's lesson teaches us that whatever we have, even if it's just a small donkey and her coat, if we would just offer it up to be used by God, we can not only contribute, but we can play a major role in the work of God in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. This narrative is... uh, is one of the few stories that is present in all four of the Gospels in some form or fashion. Uh, but one thing to notice in this narrative is that the Bible never names the two disciples. It never names the owners of the coat. It never names the bystanders who question them when they go to get the, uh, the donkey and the coat. Uh, all we know is that Jesus sent two people to get two animals, and the crowd questioned them. But when they announced that they were doing the work, of the Lord, the bystanders let them go and the owners never stop them. When we give what we have for use of the Lord, for God to do what he sees fit, the truth is we may never have our name in lights, we may never be recorded in the history books, but we can be a, plan, a part of God's plan of salvation in the lives of other people. We may not be able to save the entire world, but we can definitely submit to the will of God and perform the role that he has determined for each of us, and we will be astonished about how God can use what little bit we have to do major and big things in the life of the church. So we see the modest king in verse 1, jumping down to verses 2 and 3, we saw the Lord needs them. And then in verses 4 and 5, we see a donkey as a sign of peace. Again, reading from the 21st chapter of Matthew, the New King James Version, verses 4 and 5, the text reads, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a coat, the foal of a donkey. So in the fourth and the fifth verse, we see Zechariah's prophecy again, from Zechariah chapter 9, confirmed in the manner in which Jesus will enter Jerusalem. 
it is impossible to look at this portion uh, uh, of the lesson without identifying the political climate of the time. Uh, and, and we know uh, from current events uh, in the world around us that politics plays such an uh, important role in the way that we go around doing things. As a matter of fact, the war in Ukraine and Russia is just kind of snowballing out of control simply because of politics. Uh, because instead of just standing up for people that are being unfairly treated, uh, almost a possible genocide, the world is back down because of a political power, because of gasoline prices. And, and, and politics really shapes the way that we not only interact, but we react to bad things around us. So the Romans at this time, they had covered much of the known world, uh, conquered uh, pretty much everything, and, and they had covered it with their presence to the extent that the world was known as the Roman Empire. Uh, the, uh, Jerusalem, the children of Israel, again, found themselves under the occupation of foreign rulers. And if we remember from our lessons towards the end of the summer last year and through the fall, we talked about extensively how the prophets continued to warn Israel that if they did not remain obedient to God, that God would allow them to fall into the hands of their captors, and that their disobedience would be a sign uh, for them and for others that if they did not remain obedient to God and do what God had demanded of them, that he would remove his covering, his blessing from them. And so we've seen the difficulties that Israel has endured uh, during their previous captivities at the hands of the Egyptians, the Assyrians, and the Babylonians, which we just covered in the last three or four lessons. But Roman occupation, now 400 years uh, after the Old Testament completes, uh, is completed, excuse me, was different than the others because the Romans really uprooted Israel's way of life. While they were allowed to remain in their homelands and weren't necessarily marched off as slaves in a foreign land, Israel was forced to adopt the Roman language. They were forced to pay heavy taxes and give up their land and possessions on command. And so uh, the Romans, similar to what the Babylonians had did or attempted to do, they really uh, was an indoctrination that had taken place where the children of Israel were no longer allowed to speak Hebrew, but they were forced to speak Greek. That's why the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and the New Testament is in Greek. They were forced to use a monetary system that was universal. Uh, they were forced to use these roads and travel systems that the Romans had created. In a way, it modernized and created a global economy that was easier for trade and for communication, but it also very much so uh, put a damper on Israel as a unique uh, nation uh, and, and so Roman occupation, while it wasn't as destructive from a physical standpoint as the other occupations Israel had gone through, it was probably more devastating from a social and political and, uh, and uh, religious perspective. So Israel, uh, because of their dis defiance against God, again, I told you this was 400 years since the Old Testament had concluded. This is known as the uh, uh, the silent period, where Israel had been cut off from the voice of God. The God's voice was silent among the, his children. And so Israel had made up in their mind or convinced themselves that because of their disobedience, that they had now drifted so far away from God that they were beyond hope. And we remember in, when they first got to Babylon, one of the prophets had to remind Israel, like, listen, you're going to be here for a while. Uh, like marry, build homes, start families, because this is something that you're going to have to endure. Towards the end of the Babylonian occupation, when Nehemiah and Ezra began to request a return uh, to, to Jerusalem, to the promised land, there were some children of Israel that had convinced themselves that they were better off in Babylon, that it wasn't worth going back, that their defiance and disobedience at the hands of their ancestors was so bad that God had no desire for them as his chosen people any longer. And so in just 70 years of Babylonian occupation, this mindset crept in. Well, now imagine 400 years of silence, of, of God's voice being silent amongst his people. Many of the children of Israel had convinced themselves that they had become so disobedient that God had removed his hand from them. And they accepted the fact that this was their fate. Now, when Jesus had returned, and, or excuse me, when Jesus was born and began his ministry for the last three years, there was a new excitement and a new buzz 
a new energy throughout all of Israel. And they began to hope that Jesus was the promised Messiah that would save them. And they were looking for a political revolution at the hands of Christ. Uh, there was a nationwide hope that he was the promised king, the promised Messiah, and that he would be the one to end the Roman occupation that they were dealing with and return them to the prominence that they once had as a national power uh, with the backing of God. The Romans were well aware of this prophecy, and they were looking at ways to thwart any uprising or any rebellion that may come from this messianic Messiah. On top of all this, the elders of the church were none too happy about Jesus because his, his ministry, I guess the best way to say it, it opposed the hustle of the church and his message really didn't fit with their personal agendas. We saw when Jesus entered the uh, temple and overthrew the money tables and said that my house would not be uh, uh, a den of thieves. Uh, the church had really monetized worship and found a way to enrich themselves. And Jesus came kind of abolishing that practice. And so from all different perspectives, people expected different things and people were really intimidated by Jesus's arrival into Jerusalem because they did not know what it meant for themselves personally. Now, Jesus entering on a donkey would not only signify peace, uh, the peace that he would eventually bring to the world through the gift of salvation, but the manner in which he would face the challenges to God's agenda of salvation of the world. Jesus didn't fight back. Even when uh, Peter cut off the ear of one of his arresters, uh, one of the people that came to arrest Jesus, he put it back on because Jesus was a man of peace. Uh, finally, let's not overlook the main character of our story so far. The donkey is considered a lowly creature. It isn't able to do much work. It isn't the most majestic or beautiful of animals. What better way can Jesus show a rejection of his divinity and his ability to meet humanity than, uh, right where we are than riding on a lowly donkey in Jerusalem? And so Jesus, in a way, one of the best things that Christ did for us was denied his divinity and took on the flesh of, of humanity. And the reason was not only to just dwell amongst us, but to give us the perfect example of how to face sin and the challenges of life. Jesus was tempted, yet he knew no sin. And many times we make excuses when we make mistakes and we say things like, oh, I'm just a man or I'm only human. But Jesus was just a man and he was only human too. Yet he found the strength based on his obedience and connection to the Father to overcome the challenges of temptation. And what better way to portray this meek and humble approach to living than for Jesus, God in flesh, to humble himself and ride into Jerusalem on a donkey? Many of us, uh, as we reach certain statuses in our life and as we gain acclaim, and notoriety, we start to expect certain things, expect certain uh, responses. Uh, uh, my mother was a judge, a Trick County judge here in Chicago. And whenever you were in her courtroom, whenever she would enter the court, the bailiff would stand and ask that all shall rise in respect and honor to the judge, the, the leader of that court. And uh, it was it was a way to respect the authority that my mother had in that courtroom, at least. And from the same perspective, oftentimes when we reach statuses, when we become a judge, when we become the boss, when we become the president, the chairman, when we become the director, when we become the pastor, when we become the pre uh, the president, we expect people to treat us a certain way. Jesus the most powerful man to ever walk this earth, Jesus, God himself, Jesus, the savior of the entire world. He didn't come through with big lights. He didn't come through with an entourage. He didn't have a big parade, but he came through lowly riding on a donkey to show that even the most important man in the world can show humility and reject all the prestige and the fame. And in our lives, it's so easy to be consumed with the accolades of life. It's so easy to be overwhelmed with how people treat us, especially when we feel as if we earned that treatment. However, we must think of ourselves never too highly where we lift ourselves up amongst, or excuse me, above other people. Like Jesus did, we must be willing and ready to humble ourselves 
to lower ourselves, to submit to the will of God. And only then will we truly be able to be used by God. Uh, one of the worst things that you can do as a child of God is have someone say he thinks or she thinks she's all that. She thinks that she's better than me. He thinks that he's better than me. Because those things only distance us from the very people that God has called us to reach and to be light shining in the midst of darkness too. And if we're ever going to be effective in the ministries that God has placed us on, in, excuse me, or effective in the jobs that God has called us to do, then we must learn how to lower ourselves, to humble ourselves, so that we can be approachable and ready to be used by God. So we see the modest chain in verse 1, the Lord needs them in 2 and 3, a donkey as a sign of peace in verses 4 and 5. But then in verse 6 through 9, we move down, and this portion of the lesson is entitled the red carpet red carpet treatment. It says to read, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the coat, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So in this part of the lesson, we see the disciples being fully obedient to Jesus and playing their role in this narrative. They didn't make any alterations or do what they think is best. And I was joking with my friend about how many th ways this thing could go wrong. And I was trying to explain that the uh, the getting of a donkey was probably the equivalent of going to a rental car and picking up a rental for Jesus to uh, begin this parade into Jerusalem. I, I, I was jokingly saying that somebody would have probably said, oh, these two donkeys don't look that good. I, I know someone that has four donkeys for half the price. Uh, someone would have took the donkey for a test drive and crashed it or got a speeding ticket. Or someone would have tried to make money off the donkeys and rented them out for an hour because Jesus didn't need them for three hours. In life, there is a natural inclination to think we can do things better. I'll never forget, never forget, uh, when I was first learning how to barbecue, I watched my father, I got the recipes, talked to my Uncle Steve, watched videos. I thought I really had it down. And there were steps that were specific to take. And for some reason, in my mind, one of the steps didn't make sense, at least in the order in which it was done. And so I made up in my own mind that I would change the order. Now, the food wasn't horrible, but it was nowhere near as good as it could have been. And it was because I uh, put brown sugar on the ribs to make them sweet. Uh, but I did it. I didn't use light brown sugar, and I did it early in the cooking process. The brown sugar kind of caramelized on the ribs, and they began to burn. And because I put them on so early, the skin of the crust of the ribs were pretty burnt. And it was pretty, it, like, again, they were edible, but they weren't as good as they could have been. I had knew exactly what to do, how to do it. I've asked all the questions, the right questions. I took the right notes, did the right preparation. But still, it was something in my mind that said, all these experts that you went to for help, maybe you know something better than what they know. And I messed it up. And in life, even in ministry, I don't know where we get this inclination that we know what's best, but we have the ability to mess up even the best plans. And what's amazing to me is here these disciples didn't jack this thing up. They trusted God and they were obedient to God. And because of that, uh, God's will was done. Think of all the ways in our lives where we knew what was expected. We knew how to do something. We knew the right and the wrong way to do it. Yet in our mind, something convinced us between our acceptance of the task and the implementation of doing it the right way. Something happened where we decided we knew what was best. When we are doing the will of the Lord, it is imperative that we completely submit to God and that we don't decide to do anything differently than what God commands. We, ha we should have all learned by now that God's way is always, and I wish I could put big capital letters, God's way is always better than our own way in our lives. So this narrative shifts uh, to Jesus entering the city, and Matthew shows us the response of the people. As Jesus is sitting on his donkey and rides in, the, be the people begin to line the streets with their uh, clothes and palm branches from the trees. Uh, the palm branches were very important during biblical times. They were one of the trees that grew well in the promised land, and they were often depicted on coins and official correspondence. Many of the coins, as we have eagles, 
and other things like uh, landmarks on some of our uh, uh, money, American money. Back then, they would have pictures of uh, uh, palm trees and palm branches on the coins. Not only that, but it was uh, very important in the life of the children of Israel. Because if we look at how Saul, when he built the temple, uh, he had uh, carved uh, palm trees and palm branches in the wood of the temple uh, 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 going around uh, to decorate the temple. Uh, the palm trees were generally used to signify goodness, triumph, victory. Uh, and they were commonly used during royal processions, especially when the king was victorious. This impromptu parade that we see taking place was birthed out of Israel's desire to free themselves from Roman occupation and again to reform, to return to some form of uh, national prestige that they had longed uh, for, that they had only heard stories about during the time of David and Solomon. Uh, after 400 years of silence and 400 years of suffering at the hands of the Roman occupiers to Israel, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem marked a new era and a rebirth of some sorts, a reclamation project where Israel would defeat their enemy once again and rise to national promise. Uh, as Jesus enters Jerusalem, we hear the crowd shout, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This proclamation not only recognizes Jesus as the Savior, uh, the promised Messiah, but it literally means save, please. And so the crowd cries out to Jesus Christ. Please save us, knowing that they're in need of salvation. So we saw the martyrs came, Matthew 21, verse 1. The Lord needs them, Matthew 21, 2 and 3. A donkey as a sign of peace, Matthew 21, 4 and 5. And then the red carpet treatment, Matthew 21, 6 through 9. And then we can finally conclude this lesson, Matthew chapter 21, the 10th and 11th verses, with a simple question, who is this? The verse uh, 10 and 11, Matthew chapter 21, the verses read, and when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. In the conclusion of this lesson, we unfortunately see a common consequence when Christians celebrate. The ruckus gets the attention of the community, and they immediately begin to question why all this fuss is being made over a man riding on a donkey. Now, Jer Jerusalem had grown to become one of the major trading depots, and the citizens represented many different cultures and ethnicities. It wasn't the promised land as we see depicted in the Old Testament anymore. Jerusalem was a uh, melting pot. Uh, imagine New York or uh, some parts of Chicago where you just see different people from different races, different cultures, just kind of all blended in together. And also remember that this narrative is taking place during the pa Passover celebration a time in which Jews from all over commuted to the holy city. So the number of Jews that were in Jerusalem had grown exponentially over the last few days, and they were celebrating the entry of their meek and humble king as if the emperor of Rome was entering himself. So you got all these Roman citizens from different ethnicities, cultures, and backgrounds that do not believe in the same things the children of Israel believe in. They see their city as being ran over, overran, excuse me, with an influx of Jews because of the Passover celebration. And then this impromptu parade uh, burst out, but the celebration fit for a king, and all they see is this man riding on the donkey by himself. Fearful of a coup or uprising or resistance, the celebration was questioned by the community of Roman citizens, and the Bible says they were moved, which, meant re which really means they were stirred, uh, they were uncomfortable with what they were seeing, and it caused them to question. The citizens questioned Jesus' followers. Who is this man that you are making all this noise for? And the response was simple. This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. Now let's pretend for a, mo a moment that we don't know how the story ends, that we don't have the ability to skip forward a few pages and see how uh, the crucifixion and Jesus' death and resurrection takes place. The children of Israel, in the midst of the Passover celebration, are now given more hope and promise than they've had in over 400 years. They are excited because God is about to do something new in their lives, and they are able to witness it firsthand. Now, unfortunately for them, they had made up in their mind what God was going to do and how he was going to do it, and they were way off target. But yet and still, the work that God completed during this entry, during the week that Christ experienced his passion, during Christ's eventual uh, crucifixion, 
burial, and resurrection. It's the gift of eternal life that is freely available to each and every person in all of creation. God in his infinite wisdom was doing something so much greater, so much bigger than anyone could really fathom. Yet the children of Israel walked away disappointed. One of the worst things that can happen in life is God giving us not what we want, but God giving us exactly what we need. And in our minds, we feel as if God has let us down or God has abandoned us. One thing that I can testify to in my own life, I'm 39 years old, is that I, I, I haven't been through a lot. As a matter of fact, because of God's grace and mercy, I've been spared from some of the things that I should have been through. But I've come to learn and to trust that even when I don't like it, when it doesn't make sense, and when I don't understand what's happening, that as long as I'm within the will of God, it always works out for my good, and it is much better than I could have ever worked out for myself. And so even though God may not do things the way I would desire for him to do them, on the time in which I wish he would do those things, I've come to trust that God's way, and again, I wish I had that always, always better than my way. The children of Israel wanted a, a, a political uh, upheaval. They wanted to dethrone the Roman emperor. They wanted to reclaim the, the, the land of Jerusalem for their own. And while those things would have been good, what God did was so much better. He, he offered salvation for the entire world. And the truth is that I, as well as many of us that are listening today, if it wasn't for the work that Christ did those 2,000 years ago by allowing himself to be nailed to that cross, freely giving his life for us to be saved, we wouldn't be here right now. We wouldn't have access to a faith and a God that loves us more than we can love ourselves. So I challenge each and every one of us today, look in our lives. Don't do what we think is best. Don't do what we think is most comfortable, but do what God has taught us to do. And we can just see how God will start to do amazing things, not only in our lives, but in the lives of the people around us. I honestly believe that we have everything that we need to change this world. We have enough resources, enough people, enough money, and enough faith. The only thing that's lacking is obedience. And if the church would become obedient to God as one body, moving forward collectively, together, doing exactly what God has taught us to do, we can really change this world for the better. Hey Amen. What a wonderful story. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your presence. But most importantly, thank you for your prayers. Uh, for those of you all that are joining us for the first time, or for those of you all that have been uh, following along with us, we have been sharing this lessons uh, through our Sunday school, our, our Sunday school lessons through our social media pages since the onset of this COVID pandemic. Uh, each Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. is our Bible class. Sunday morning is our Sunday school. And then we have our live worship service at 11 o'clock a.m. So we encourage you to follow and uh, subscribe to our page, turn your notifications on so that you can get, uh, 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 so you can be aware uh, when we're going live, when we're sharing our, our Christian education lessons and our worship services. For those of you all that would like to support the work we're doing here at Friendship, we do have four ways to give. You can give on Cash App, dollar sign Friendship Chicago. You can give online on our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can always text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462, or you can mail or your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, care of Dr. Reginald E. Back is 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 606. Four, four. For those of you all who have given already or are considering to give, we really appreciate uh, the support of this work and the ministry that we're doing here at Friendship. And we encourage you, regardless if it's here at your own local church or find someplace that's preaching the word of God, we encourage you to support the work as churches all throughout this country, throughout this world, continue to strive to do what God has called us to do. Uh, again, we're excited about this time of year as we inch closer towards our Easter celebration. Uh, and uh, just two weeks away, uh, I would uh, advise you, if you're looking for some good preaching, join us at 11 a.m. for our live worship service each Sunday morning. Uh, Pastor Backus is one of God's finest preachers, and you'll hear some great preaching and great encouragement, great instruction throughout the week. Uh, so thank you for your, again for your presence. Thank you for your prayers. And we ask that God's will be done in your life, that God reveal himself to you more clearly, that we might be better equipped to do his will. 
Uh, let's just miss in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for each and every person that has joined us today, whether uh, intentionally or by accident. We know that all things happen according to your purpose for our lives, according to your will. So, Father, we ask that this lesson be used to strengthen our walk with you, to encourage us, to give us hope and promise, knowing that no matter what life hands us, that you will not only see us through, but you will help us to overcome. Father, we thank you for the gift that you gave us in your son, Jesus Christ, that he gave his life that we might be saved. Father, help us to remember that gift as we live our lives, as we go about our daily routine, putting you in the forefront of all things. And then finally, Father, help us to be obedient to you, even when it's uncomfortable, even when we don't know how things will work out. Help us to trust that you will always, always have what's good for us in your heart. And if we simply remain obedient to you, that things will work out for our good. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this church, our pastor. We thank you for our superintendent. We thank you for each and every Sunday school instructor and student throughout all of creation. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless and have a wonderful day.